tncradio.live. This is the Truckers Network Radio Show. Now here's your host, Shelly Johnson. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Welcome to a special Halloween edition of the Truckers Network Radio Show on tncradio.live where we offer the news, weather, information, and entertainment our commercial drivers want and need. Most everyone's heard that creepy little childhood song we just played. Did Lizzie Borden really do what the legend says she did in Fall River, Massachusetts? Did you know people can stay the night in the Lizzie Borden house and their ghost stories? We wanted to find out more. So we invited Jared Robinson. He's the general manager of the Lizzie Borden House in Fall River. He works for U.S. Ghost Adventures that offers ghost tours to America's most haunted places. Welcome, Jared. Thank you for being with us on the show today. Thanks for having me. I I don't think I can uh, match the creepiness of that intro, though. (laughs) <laughs> well, we wanted to make it as ghoulish as possible because it's Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> you did it. That was great. Awesome. I thought what we could do for those who aren't familiar, maybe we could talk a little bit about the history of Lizzie Borden. Who was she? What happened? Sure. Yeah, let's get into this thing. So Lizzie Borden was the daughter of a fairly wealthy businessman in Fall River, Massachusetts in the 19th century. It was, it's hard to imagine Fall River now, what it was then, because Fall River was really on the map. It was a growing city. I think it was the 40th largest city at the time in the U.S. Um, It was a booming industrial town. So Fall River was a happening place, and it was really on the map. And Lizzie Borden's father, Andrew Borden, was a fairly wealthy businessman here in that city. Um... On August 4th, 1892, an unknown assailant would enter their home on 92 2nd Street and murder Andrew Borden and his wife, Abby Durfee Gray Borden, the stepmother of Lizzie Borden, with what we think is a hatchet. Uh, We actually don't even know the murder weapon. And when you think of that little nursery rhyme, Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. There's a lot of things to uh, break down in there that aren't quite true. Number one, Lizzie was acquitted. Um, We don't know what the murder weapon was. It wasn't necessarily an axe. And even the blows to the heads, it, it wasn't 40 and 41 wax. It was more like 12 or 13 or 18 and 19 that's still quite a few oh yeah yeah this is probably a crime of passion (laughs) Mm, but ultimately lizzie uh you know she she spends about 11 months in jail awaiting trial um after the trial she is acquitted and she goes on to live a pretty interesting but relatively non-axe murdery life afterwards. Oh, well, that's a good thing. Did she have many <laughs> friends after all of this happened? Or? She did, believe it or not. She oh, wow. she was, so this is the interesting thing. She was kind of embraced by the, the wealthy elite community that she was a part of during the trial. But after the trial and after she's acquitted, she moves into their neighborhood and they kind of ostracize her a little bit. But she finds friends in, uh, believe it or not, in the theater world. So she makes friends in New York and Boston and London and she brings a bunch of actors kind of back to her house for soirees and parties. Okay. And did she uh, teach them method acting? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I guess it depends on what uh, what route you're going. I'm sure that was the topic of conversation at many parties. <laughs> wow. So was she guilty? And what has been the debate about that? Because obviously they didn't have the forensics that they right. have today. Right. I, I think... Well, right out the gate, we really don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've told this story hundreds of times, thousands of times probably actually at this point, and I still don't know. I'll tell you this much. She was home at the time of the murders, but so was Bridget Sullivan, who was the the maid for the family. She was home and inside the house, at least for one of the murders. Mm -hmm. Um, Their uncle, John Vinicum Morse, was in town. He actually stayed with the family the night before. Uh, he, he does have a pretty strange and strong alibi. Um, but I think most people who come through the house 
will go into the camp of maybe she didn't quite do it, but they find it hard to believe that she had nothing to do with it. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, the fact that there were so many blows to both of the bodies, uh, like you said, crime of passion. If it wasn't Lizzie, it had to be somebody who really hated her father and mother. Yeah, the nature of the crime would suggest that. I mean, obviously, it could have been a fluke. We've seen, you know, robberies gone wrong that things like this happen, but it's it's very rare. It would su certainly suggest that this was a crime of passion and someone who really wanted to see them dead. How would somebody get away with murdering both of these people in separate rooms without somebody hearing this and coming to the victim's rescue? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that it plays into why they go with Lizzie for sure. Mm -hmm. Because when Abby is murdered, she's murdered first on the second floor of the house. Lizzie says she's ironing handkerchiefs in the dining room. And if she were in the dining room at the time, she would have heard Abby being murdered. That's been tested. It was tried. But she also says that it's possible she could have been in the kitchen reheating the iron. She possibly could have been in the basement. So if she was in those parts of the house, maybe she wouldn't have heard it. Um, Bridget Sullivan, the time of uh, Abby Borden's death, she is outside washing windows. And that's corroborated by some other witnesses uh, on the street at the time. So that gives her a bit of an alibi and why she might not have heard anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it is hard to imagine though, that they wouldn't have heard anything. And it's tough because Bridget is inside the house when Andrew's murdered next. And even though she's on the third floor of the house, it's still, again, it's hard to imagine that she didn't hear any ruckus downstairs, nothing. And if, if it were someone coming into the house, um, you know, and it wasn't Lizzie or something, you know, I, I would have thought, you know, maybe the door would have slammed or there would have been a little bit of some rustling or something that would have alerted her, even on the third floor. So it, it's hard to imagine that Bridget and Lizzie wouldn't have heard anything. Sure. And certainly Lizzie had motive. She didn't get along well with her stepmother, did she? Yeah, as far as we know, their relationship certainly was strained. Um, she does say to a police officer on the scene, she's not my mother, she's my stepmother. Um, it, and as far as we know, Emma, her sister, Lizzie's older sister, who also lived with the family at the time, she also had a pretty strained relationship with Abby, and, and her relationship was actually strained well before Lizzie's. Um, so the, the, there was a lot of tension in the house, for sure. Do you know offhand if Lizzie had a history of being a little odd or violent? Or As far as my understanding goes, it, it's... It's a little bit hard to say for certain mm -hmm. that she was, you know, odd or after something like this, of course, people would speak and say certain things. And a lot of people came to her defense. But of course, other people would say, well, you remember, I, I, I remember her doing this, you know, and I don't know how much of that is motivated by the murders and, in you know, going through that. So as far as what we really, truly know there's nothing to suggest that she would have been capable of something like this. Now, both of the daughters, Lizzie and her sister, would have been considered somewhat odd. They were spinsters in, in, in that generation, in that era. They weren't married. That is, that's certainly the odd part. Um, they're both living at home with their father and stepmother. Emma's in her early 40s. Lizzie's in her early 30s. They are living with their father. Um, mm. But when you look at the, the layout of everything, of town specifically, they're living in a mostly immigrant neighborhood at the time. Um, it was much more working class, so they didn't have a ton of friends in their neighborhood. Most of the people of wealth in Fall River were living on what was called the hill. So that really would have been where all their contemporaries were living. So when you think of the isolation of where they're living at the time, um, it does make a little bit more sense why they're spinsters, why they're 
why they weren't married at that point because their neighborhood, their surroundings, their father was notoriously cheap and, and people judged him. If anyone was a little bit strange in society, it was really their father. He was living well below their means. He didn't have electric light. He didn't have running water in the house. Um, they were using privies and outhouses and bedpans, um, kerosene lamps. Um, he was, you know, wearing tattered suits and hats. So oh, wow. if anyone that we have documentation for, for being a little strange, it's really Andrew. It's really their dad. Interesting. And I was reading that the stepmother was somehow getting him to give money to her family. Yes. Yes. That certainly drives a wedge. And as far as we know, that kind of seems to be the, the nail in the coffin for Lizzie and their relationship. Um, it's, Abby comes to Andrew, this notoriously cheap man making his family live in a house well below their means in a neighborhood without their friends. And Abby comes to him and says, hey, my sister's kind of fallen on some tough luck. Is there anything you could do to help her out? And anyone would have thought Andrew would say no, but he doesn't. He actually gives her um, considerable a considerable gift to Abby's sister um, that really sustains them for the foreseeable future and that is kind of like a threat basically to lizzie and emma's inheritance mm -hmm. um and, and andrew must have seen the fault in this because he does shortly afterwards gift uh lizzie and emma uh the house they were actually born in and it becomes their first source of income as well mm -hmm. so he must have seen that he, he made an error here um but yeah it's it, it's there's a lot of tension i think there's tension simply for the layout of the house too. I mean, we talked about that real briefly before this. Um, I would definitely suggest anyone to go, you know, check out the layout or just come see the house so you can get that visual. There are no hallways, so. We have to go to break. I wanted to talk more about that because just the way the house is laid out is creepy in and of itself. It's like, wow, this is pretty interesting. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show. We're talking with Jared Robinson. He's the general manager of the Lizzie Borden House in Fall River, Massachusetts. There's some great stories, so stay tuned right here for the special Halloween edition of the Truckers Network radio show on TNCRadio.live. Industry Movement Trucking Moves America Forward is telling the story of the industry. Our safety champions, the women of trucking, independent contractors, the next generation of truckers, and more. Help us promote the best of our industry. Share your story and what you love about trucking. Share images of a moment you're proud of. And join us on social media. Learn more at TruckingMovesAmerica.com. Welcome back to a very special Halloween edition of the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live. I'm Shelley Johnson with Tom Kelly, and we're talking with Jared Robinson, the general manager of the Lizzie Borden House in Fall River. This is creepy. Oh, my goodness, Jared, you've really given us a lot of detail on what happened with Lizzie and all the speculation. And before we went to break, you were talking about the house and how it's laid out. Then we had some technical problems, and you were saying that's not unusual when Lizzie's brought up for some reason. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it's one of those things where I am never quick to jump to, ooh, it was ghosts or anything like that. But anything with technology, anything, you know, electronics in the house. And, you know, when we talk about Lizzie, sometimes this stuff really, truly does happen. It's really strange. But when when I we were told there were some tech issues, uh -huh. I'm really not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens so like when people are going through for a tour do their cameras now work or their phones or what happens? oh absolutely they'll go from 100 percent battery to nothing um they'll use their camera and their camera they'll take a you know a, a photo and then it'll come back completely blurry or the photo won't be taken at all um nothing will be seen and it just happens all the time and you know, sometimes you think, all right, maybe they're just playing into it a little bit mm -hmm. um, and kind of letting their mind get the better of them. But the amount of times it happens on a daily basis, there's something going on. <laughs> That's really bizarre. Now, are there specific rooms where these things happen in the house? 
I I wouldn't say so. I think it's it's pretty much the house and property in general. Um, but it doesn't seem to all happen at the same time. So it, it seems to kind of isolate itself to certain areas of the house uh, at any given occasion. It's not typically like the entire house is, you know, getting activity like this at all times. Um, so I, I think quite often it'll be the third floor. Um, that seems to get a lot of activity. The room where Abby and Andrew were both murdered in, there's definitely a lot of activity in there. And then the dining room, the dining room seems to get a lot of activity as well. Wow. Now, before we talk about more of the experiences that people have when they either tour or stay the night in the house, how is this house laid out? Tom and I were looking at the floor plan and it's just, frankly, it's odd. It, it, it certainly is odd when you think of it, especially in today's standards. But if you think of it as a two family, because that's what the house was originally built as. Um, and, and anyone who's been to New England has probably seen a lot of these. It's pretty much a standard two family um, that you would have seen in any New England mill town, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so it's one room leading into the next room, into the next room. There's no hallways, uh, but it does create a strange layout when you take that two family and convert it into a single family, because now one room leads into the next room, but that one room might be someone's bedroom and then the next room might be someone's bedroom. Um, so it does really kind of create an interesting layout here. Um, for example, to get to Andrew and Abby's room, they had to go up the back staircase. They couldn't go up the front stairs because then they would have had to cut through Lizzie and Emma's room. Um, and there was a doorway in between there, but they had nailed it shut. They kitty cornered a bed there. Uh, they put uh, a bookshelf on one side of the bed. So they really, they tried to make some privacy in this house, but it, it was tricky. It's kind of like a fun house from the sounds of it. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Um, it, it's it's once you see it and visualize it, it, it certainly helps. And with the understanding that it was formerly a, a two family before the Bordens owned the home, uh, that does explain a lot. But honestly, it's it's quite comfortable when you're there. <laughs> Looking at the pictures of the house from the outside, it does not look all that inviting, but you said it has a different ambiance when you walk inside? It certainly does. It, it you know, it, I think a lot of people expect to show up and still see the crime scenes untouched. Yeah, um, yeah. But the house is preserved much in the 19th century way. Um, when they initially converted it into a bed and breakfast in the 1990s, uh, my family had some help in picking out the wallpaper and the carpeting. And a lot of it they did from the crime scene photos, but, you know, they foregoed the blood spatters or <laughs> blood stains or anything oh, like that. Um, so it, it's pretty warm. It's pretty welcoming. It's got an eeriness to it that's kind of undeniable. But overall, I'd say it's a pretty comfortable home. The staff dresses in period costume, too. Yes, some of our staff will go in period costume. Um, some of them wear, you know, some of them go a lot more all out than others with like really interesting things. Like, for example, one of our staff members will go dressed as Dr. Bowen. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Dolan. Uh, so like some of them go very specific. Others will just kind of wear, you know, your typical uh, Victorian era uh, styles. Now, who is Dr. Dolan? Dr. Dolan was a medical examiner who uh, was who kind of led the autopsies. Okay. Um, Dr. Bowen, the, the first doctor that I said, was the family doctor, who also was there um, on the day of the murders. He was there in the crime um, at, shortly afterwards, and he's kind of an interesting character, too. What was he like? Dr. Bowen was the family doctor. He lived um, just a few houses down. He showed up the night before or the day before the murders um, to check on Abby, who had uh, gone to him saying that she thought she was being poisoned, um, which is very interesting yeah. that the week that there would be murdered to speculate that she was being poisoned. Um, he ends up prescribing Lizzie. Um, he prescribes Lizzie morphine from the day of the murders for the 
every day throughout, you know, till the trial ends. Um, and he doesn't quite disclose this until he's on the stand. So he's, it's almost like he's helping her <laughs> in some way. Yeah. I don't want to go so far as to say that he was, but uh, it, it's certainly some information that he probably should have disclosed yeah. <laughs> before then. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, when you're talking about poisoning, it wasn't uncommon in that era for people to be given arsenic over a stretch of time when it was somebody with a diabolical intent. I think it was widely available and widely used, too, for, you know, getting rid of varmints and that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. And and there's a local pharmacist who actually even comes out and says... Hey, Lizzie Borden was here at the pharmacy trying to buy prussic acid mm. um, the the week of the murders. And Lizzie, apparently, I, this this can't even be used in court because they can't verify. There's no cameras or anything like this. Um, and there were plenty of people coming forward saying things like this. But he said that Lizzie was going to use it to clean some seal skin coats um, and that he wouldn't actually give it to her without a doctor's prescription. <laughs> Which is probably good. Yeah, I think, you know, if the family had been poisoned, I'm not sure we would really be talking about this anymore either. <laughs> now, they didn't have a good way of detecting things at that time. The forensic investigations were very primitive. I'm yes. not even sure fingerprints were in use at that time. Yeah, you know, you bring up a really good point because... They do apparently send the stomachs to Harvard Medical School, which is in relatively close proximity to Fall River. Mm -hmm. um, in today's world, it's only about an hour away. So they, they do actually send the stomach contents to Harvard Medical School to test for poison. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly what those tests really looked like um, and how accurate they were, to be honest with you, either. Um, but again, like you, again, you're hitting the nail on the head because a big way they could tell when someone died at the time was to test the stomach contents and see how much they had digested based on when they had breakfast. And sure, it's kind of a good indicator, um, but at least in today's forensics, we have better ways to determine death or at least more ways to determine death, uh, time of death. Um, so again, it's, it's one of those things where forensics were definitely not what they are now. Um, and on top of it, too, uh, crime scene etiquette is not was not what it is now. Right. So you're talking, you know, people coming through the crime scene, messing with things. You know, the public was even kind of getting into the house at the time. So there's a lot of things that were in its infancy that probably would have changed the outcome in today's world. Oh, absolutely. What they didn't have available really was um, it made for quite the panacea, quite the opportunity for someone wanting to do something sinister at that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it doesn't sound like Lizzie was a stupid lady. I Definitely not. Yeah. She probably planned things uh, quite well in advance if, in fact, she was guilty. We do have to go to break here, Jared. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show on TNCRadio.live. We're talking with Jared Robinson. He's the general manager of the Lizzie Borden House. Stay tuned for more coming up. TNCRadio.live is proud to carry the Steve Summers Overnight Drive Show. TNCRadio.live is dedicated to commercial drivers. We offer the news, traffic, and weather you need and the entertainment, sports, talk, music, and celebrity interviews you want to hear 24-7. We have original shows and trucker podcasts that feature some of your favorites, like Ice Road Alex Demogorski and America's truckin' sweetheart Marcia Campbell. TNCRadio.live is convenient and designed for professional drivers. The best part is we're free, and you can listen anywhere you are on the road. With just one tap, you can tune into Steve Summers and us right on your phone. Simply download our app, by going to app.tncradio.live. That's app.tncradio.live. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, gave her father 40 that really is 
is a creepy song, but it's also a terrifying tale. The Legend of Lizzie Borden. We're talking with Jared Robinson, the general manager of the Lizzie Borden House in Fall River. People can actually go for tours in the house. It's set up much like it was in the time of Lizzie Borden and, of course, the two murders of her stepmother and her father in 1892. Jerry, did you want to talk a little bit more about the house and what people have experienced both when they tour the house and when they spend the night? Yeah, of course, I'd be happy to do this. Um, and, you know, I, I think the best way for people to just to kind of close out the the uh, the layout part of all of this, I think the best way to see the house would be to stay a night. So uh, if you go to lizzie-borden.com slash stay, so that's L-I-Z-Z-I-E dash B-O-R-D-E-N dot com slash stay, you can book an overnight stay directly through our website. You can check out the rooms. You can look at exactly, you know, what date you're looking for. Um, and it's really the best way to kind of see the whole house and kind of check, you know, check things out. Um, and it's also probably the best way if you're into the paranormal stuff, it's probably the best way to experience that. Um, our tours are a little bit more of a, a quicker moving experience, you know, like 90 minutes or two hours. And we do a nightly ghost hunt as well. Um, but if you stay the night, I mean, you have the entire night to ghost hunt um, or have possibly a paranormal experience or a ghostly experience. Um, so that's something that's been happening since it's opened in the 1990s to the public. Um, and I, I remember being a kid and, and hearing stories of what people are experiencing in the house too. Um, it, it, it's, it's got an energy to it. What do people experience? So it, it's got a vast array of things. I think technology is normally like the most common thing that happens with phones, you know, draining from 100%, things with the, the cameras. Um, people sometimes do capture some strange things on video or camera. Um, we actually even just caught something ourselves uh, on our, um, our security cameras on the first floor. If you go to our YouTube channel, US Ghost Adventures, um, you can actually see it yourselves. There were two, uh, a mother and a daughter, were staying the night at the house, and they were just kind of walking around by themselves on the first floor when a closet door started to open up, and then all the lights went out. Ooh. And then wow. they noticed that the closet door was opening up, and they kind of panicked, and they ran, and they slammed the door shut. And as they slammed the door shut, all the lights came back on at the same time. It was... <laughs> it's a it's a spectacle if you watch this video but again that's it's not that uncommon with you know doors opening up that are latched shut and i and i know it's an old house and sometimes stuff like that happens um but it, it's always strange timing you know doors opening up um doors closing on their own hearing knocking on doors scratching on doors um a lot of guests report the spirits of children on the third floor and that's been happening since the 1990s um where you'll get guests at breakfast saying like all right whose kids are running around upstairs last night <laughs> and there were no <laughs> kids up there um that's a really common occurrence is people feeling the presence of children on the third floor hearing children um there's actually a lot of children's toys up there guests from around the world will come and uh kind of gift it to the spirits which is it's, it's, it's kind of a nice gesture if you think about it um <laughs> Keep the children entertained and in uh, up on the third floor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> it's 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 actually it's really sweet to think that people are caring about these children in the afterlife. Uh, but it, it's not uncommon to see some of those toys move around at night. Um, it, it just happens so regularly, and I think a lot of people at home might be listening, kind of going, "Oh, come on! I mean, this stuff must happen all the time at you know everyone's house." But I have to say the amount of times it happens and the daily occurrence of someone coming up to me and talking to me after spending the night saying, hey, man, I'm not a believer in this stuff. And this happened to me last night and I don't know how to explain it. The amount of times that happens, it, it just changes your opinion on it real fast and kind of hints like there's something going on. Was this house always owned by the Borden family or were there other people within the you know past hundred and some years living there that could account for some of this or no that's a great question uh before the bordens even lived there mm -hmm. um 
the house was, like I said, it was a two family initially and it wasn't owned by the Borden family. And I don't know a ton of information on who was actually living in the house. I know it was built by a gentleman named Southern Miller, um, for a Charles Trafton. Um, but what's really strange is the house on the side of the, our house, the neighboring house. Um, mm -hmm. it was owned by Andrew's great aunt and uncle, um, Eliza Darling Borden and Loudwick Borden. And Eliza, decades before the Borden murders, went through um, like a fit of hysteria. And she actually killed her two children at the house oh and goodness. then killed herself. Um, this was decades before the Borden, Borden murders. One of her children actually survived a third child and that's who we kind of you know the, when we talk about the children on the third floor of the house this is kind of who we're thinking of but after the Borden murders Lizzie does sell the house um, after she inherited it mm -hmm. and eventually it falls into the McGinn family and uh, there was a printing press added to the side of the house that was kind of attached to it um, it was still there when I was a kid uh, and it was when it fell into the hands of Martha McGinn um, I think she was the granddaughter of, you know, the, the first McGinn who owned the house. Mm -hmm. um, when it falls into her hands, she didn't really want to stay there so much, but her and her, she and her husband came up with the idea to open it up to the public. Um, but even Martha, she had stories about, you know, her family staying there, and, and they even had some, you know, hauntings as well. It sounds like... Uh... Based on what you were saying, there might have been a history of mental illness in the Borden family. You know? <laughs> it's great that you bring that up because they do try to bring that up in this case. But Eliza was not Lizzie's aunt by blood. Oh. It was by marriage. Okay. So they had that is they thought that. And that's why it's kind of been solidified in history. Um, but, yeah, they kind of have to throw it out. Um, and, and in all fairness, too, I mean, if if this were Lizzie or Emma who had something to do with this, there's really nothing else in their lives to suggest that they had a violent streak or anything like that. So. Mm -hmm. It's it's tough. <laughs> yeah, but you Shelley, could see where. The, Shelley, yeah, Tom. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but during this broadcast, during this segment, those who are listening keep hearing a song that keeps coming over right in the middle of the conversation. I'm not doing this. I swear, I'm not touching. I'm not hearing it. You're you're hearing it, Tom. But, oh no, my! But it goes out over over the air. <laughs> and what's this, what is the song? Magic. Magic's the name of the oh, song? Oh, 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 it's magic. Are you <laughs> kidding me? Oh, my <laughs> Lord, really? Where to you, and, and Shelly will tell you, I don't believe <laughs> anything like this. I'm not touching anything that would cause this to happen. It'll come in, play a few seconds, and go back out again. Are you joking? I'm oh, not messing funny. with you. I'm not <laughs> This is great. I don't want <laughs> like that to have. We're having some sound quality issues. I'm playing with the volume a little bit. I'm not touching any music whatsoever. It's I've got nothing on my end too that would be like yeah, even remotely impacting that. And I don't hear that at all. Yeah, no. It's, it's, so this it's, is happening in master yeah. control of the station. Yeah, this is right. This is really eerie. So I just, I, I just had to put that out there for you guys. So tell, tell me this: Does anything like this happen? Like that? Is that that? Is that no? Oh, <laughs> no, no. This is the first. <laughs> oh my goodness! I, I, and I know I, I'm just not surprised. <laughs> I'm still, I'm, I'm just not. This stuff just seems to happen. It follows me. It. <laughs> It follows the house. I I hope the listeners on the road are just like as baffled as we are. <laughs> this is great, though. I mean, it's adding to the ambiance. I think so. Mm -hmm. that, I'm, that I'm making this up, that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in a Halloween mood or something. I swear I'm not making this happen. It is. And, and I'm frustrated that it is happening because it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is great. But this adds to Halloween in the story of Lizzie Borden. Honestly, Lizzie, we're not saying anything bad about you. We're just, you know, talking about what happened. That's all. Absolutely. And I and I will say, you know, if Lizzie is there listening in some way, uh, I try to be very fair. And I'm not even entirely convinced she, you know, she did this thing. So, right. 
Yeah. You, you know, I, I, I hope that if this is Lizzie who has anything to do with this, just know, you know, I, I kind of have your back a little bit. <laughs> there you go. We have to go to break here, Jared. I want to delve into more of the experiences that people have had at the house and how people can get booked in to either take a tour or spend the night. We're talking with Jared Robinson. He's the general manager of the Lizzie Borden House in Fall River, Massachusetts. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show here on TNC Radio Live. Stay tuned for more coming up. Great leaders challenge their people not to stop at the first right answer. Tighten the Lug Nuts is the book that will help you move past that first right answer to be more effective, more productive, and more successful. This book serves as a blueprint that can be easily applied by leaders, entrepreneurs, truckers, owner-operators, all of us in our everyday lives. This is one of the best leadership books you can read to help you accelerate towards your personal and professional goals. Plus, a portion of the proceeds will be donated to truckerschristmasgroup.org. Visit tightenthelugnuts.com to order your copy today. Welcome back to a special Halloween edition of the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio. Live. We have Jared Robinson. He's the general manager of the Lizzie Borden House in Fall River with us. He's got some interesting stories he's been telling us. Before we talk about some of the experiences people have when they are on the tour there or spend the night, what was Lizzie like? You said that she might have had kind of a sense of humor. Lizzie is an interesting, interesting character in American history. She may be one of the most fascinating people in American history, truly. She she goes on to be pretty philanthropic and, you know, still work uh, tutors at the Sunday school. She donates $50,000 with her sister to found the Animal Rescue League in Fall River. Uh, she goes on to do a lot of that really cool stuff, but she also is known for having lavish parties with actors from New York and Boston and London. Um, she she apparently, and, and I'm trying to verify this story, but I've heard it so many times, she apparently signs up for... Uh, at like hatchet throwing or at, you know oh. log chopping competitions at fairs um oh she goes yeah she travels the world going to world's fairs and she's not like sh necessarily shy it's not like she's trying to hide who she is uh she does change her name to liz uh sorry she changes her name to liz beth which isn't very far off. <laughs> um, she claims that it, it 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 makes her more mature, which I guess I could see that, you know, rather than Lizzie. Um, but she's interesting. She doesn't get out of Dodge afterwards either. Like, you'd think she'd move to another city after inheriting, you know, the equivalent of about $12 million uh, in today's money. Mm -hmm. But she stays in Fall River. She moves into a big house. She names it Maplecroft. Um, she, she's a she's a cool character. I, I would love to get a, uh, like a biopic of her life after the murders that was just kind of like, just very realistic and, and historical because that's interesting enough. She never remarried or she never got married. She was always a spinster. She never married. Yep. Well, maybe the men were too afraid of marrying her. I, I don't know. You know, there are theories that she had relationships. Um, there's theories that she had a secret boyfriend. Um, there's theories that she was actually dating an actress named Nance O'Neill, who was famous. A lot of these are theories and, we have no evidence to suggest that she truly had um, an intimate romantic relationship with anyone. Um, but I mean, even she and Emma, they, they lived together until 1909. So, you know, 18 years or 17 years after the murders, they still lived together. How long did they live? They lived till 1927. They do have a falling out in 1909. Um, and Emma moves out of, Maplecroft, and she moves to Newmarket, New Hampshire for the rest of her days. Um, they were born nine years apart. They die nine days apart. That's pretty interesting, too. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so, but they still, I mean, they live together for almost their entire lives till 1909. Uh, they don't even spend two decades apart from each other. It's very, very interesting. And neither of them marry. Which makes you wonder, because women back then, there was a stigma if you yeah. get married, that that was your job, essentially. That was who you were. <laughs> uh, that was a woman's identity. And quite often, I'm not sure what the laws were in Massachusetts, but to 
be a woman without a man handling your affairs. I'm not sure they could be property owners. Could they be? There were, they, they could, um, but yeah, it was challenging. It wasn't necessarily easy. Um, there were a lot of hurdles and hoops they had to go through. Um, you know, even just inheriting the estate and all the businesses and stuff, it wasn't necessarily easy. So it definitely took someone with some tenacity to, um, you know, continue living the life that, that Lizzie goes on to live. You know, she really, she doesn't shy away from anything. And, you know, there were people judging her every oh, sure. step of the way. Well, certainly hanging around a bunch of actors. That would have raised some eyebrows for a lady of her stature at that time, too. That wasn't necessarily approved of. That's a good point, too, because that that's something that she was definitely judged on. Mm -hmm. She was judged just for hanging out with actors. And, and a lot of her community kind of ostracized her for that alone. It wasn't like, you know, if I hung out with, uh, uh, you know, like Bradley Cooper or something and people would be like, oh, look at Jared. He's a cool guy. Clearly, it was really frowned upon. They were they were looked at as kind of like slimy people. <laughs> yeah, uh, especially <laughs> when if she came from the socially elite class at the time. Absolutely. Now, when people stay the night in the house, what are some of the experiences you've heard? What are some of the stories? You said people have heard children playing on the third floor and that sort of thing? Yeah. So I've heard, you know, stories of children on the third floor. Um, I've heard uh, and, and seen pictures and videos of people, you know, with the toys moving on the third floor. Um, a lot of people will say lights will just flicker on and off. That's been happening since 19, you know, 93 or whenever. Uh, um, that's been a very common occurrence of lights just not working. Um, some people have, you know, claimed that they've seen apparitions, women uh, in long black dresses, um, a lot of shadow figures in the basement. That's the only, like, visual thing I remember as a kid uh, was seeing some kind of shadow figure in the basement. And, and there was a break in between me being at the house with my family. Um, when I was, I, I probably stopped going to the house at like eight years old until I was about 28 years old. So it was like a 20 year gap that I hadn't gone to the house. And the only thing I remembered so vividly when I walked into the door was the basement and that shadow figure. So you know, when you think of revisit things from eight years old, normally you go back and things are bigger or creepier or scarier or smaller than you remembered. This sure. was exact. So this memory for me is wow. like, it, it's a pretty, pretty significant memory there. Um, but it's, it's so interesting just to hear, especially when you hear people tell the same story who didn't hear this or have no idea, yeah. you know, especially with the children, especially with the shadow figure in the basement, um, the woman in the black dress, like those are stuff. Those are stories I hear quite often and, and there's no way they could have heard it from someone else, you know, or, yeah. you, you know, it, it's, it's not their imagination. <laughs> right. We have about three minutes here. I wanted you to let people know how they can book a tour, book a night at the Lizzie Borden house, and a little bit about U.S. ghost adventures, too. Absolutely. Happy to do that. So if you want to book um, a tour or an overnight stay, it's very, very simple. You go to lizzie-borden.com. So L-I-Z-Z-I-E-B-O-R-D-E-N.com. Um, from our website, you could shop our gift shop. We can ship things out to you. You can book tours. Um, we offer three different tours on any given occasion, which is uh, our house tours, which are more historical during the day. Uh, we have ghost tours at night, which walk around the neighborhood. Uh, and then we have a ghost hunt, which we give you some ghost hunting equipment and you go on the first floor and basement of the house at night. Um, and then U.S. Ghost Adventures, you know, if you can't make your way out here to Fall River, Massachusetts, we offer tours in 60 different cities. So... You know, you go to U.S. Ghost Adventures, uh, U-S-G-H-O-S-T-A-D-V-E-N-T-U-R-E-S.com, uh, okay. and you can book any one of our tours in 60 different cities. Uh, we offer a lot of great, really cool historical walking ghost tours. Um, every single city in this country has something interesting, an interesting story to tell, some more than others. Um, and we've handpicked 60 different cities and, you know, acquired as much historical information that, you know, is creepy and um, haunted. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you can probably find one in a city near you, wherever you are right now. 
Wow. I have heard, or I think I read somewhere that the New England area has an incredible amount of haunting <sighs> reports. And <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. This goes back, I mean, to the days of Salem. Salem, mm -hmm. Massachusetts is only about 90 minutes away from us. Yeah. Boston, Massachusetts is about 60 minutes. Providence is only about 25 minutes away from us. Mm -hmm. Newport, Rhode Island, about 40 minutes away. And all of these cities have a long track record, a long history of hauntings and, you know, unexplainable experiences and, and paranormal and, you know, paranormal enthusiasts from around the world come just to New England to, you know, check off different places on that list. <laughs> it's just amazing how certain areas of the country seem to have more activities that are reported. <laughs> whoa, 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 it's magic. <laughs> There, there you go. There you go. Like uh, Tom's been hearing this song. It just keeps during this interview about Lizzie. Maybe it's a song she's heard uh, as a ghost and likes it. I don't yeah, know. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Uh, and where again can people find the tours and how to book a night in the Lizzie Borden house? Absolutely. The easiest way to do it is lizzie-borden.com, L-I-Z-Z-I-E-B-O-R-D-E-N.com. Um, there's chat functions in there. Uh, there's a phone number listed on top that you can text or call. Uh, if you text it, it'll go to me directly. If uh, you send an email to us um, or th anything through the contact, that'll go to me directly as well. So I'd be happy to talk to anybody, uh, answer any questions. Um, I, I probably need about three days after, <laughs> after our October to kind of recoup, oh, but sure. I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm always happy to hear what people, you know, have to say. There are a lot more people doing this kind of thing, ghost hunting. And I think some of the TV shows have really spurred some curiosity. I think you're right in that. I think there's always been a, an interest in it, um, but I think now it's more widely acceptable um, mm -hmm. and people don't kind of fear that stigma of being interested in, you know, what happens afterwards. Sure. And what goes bump in the night. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> or, or the strange noises that we can hear on a radio show when we talk about Lizzie Borden. This, this uh, has uh, really been kind of different. I really appreciate it, Jared. This has been so much fun. We've been talking with Jared Robinson. He's the general manager of the Lizzie Borden House. Any other comments about Lizzie Borden, Jared? Come visit me in Fall River, Massachusetts. I'd love to have y'all. Um, it's it's a fascinating story, whether if you're interested in the history, if you're interested in the paranormal or the true crime element. Mm -hmm. We got something for everybody here. Thank you. This has been a pleasure. I really do appreciate it. You've been listening to TNC Radio Live and the Truckers Network Radio Show. Stay tuned for more great entertainment coming up. Thank you for listening to another great interview on TNC Radio Live and the Truckers Network Radio Show. All of the material you hear on TNC Radio Live on our website, our broadcasts, or our podcasts are copyrighted. There can be no distribution without the express consent of TNC Radio Live and its partners. For inquiries, write us at info at tncradio.live.